much for inviting me. Um, well, I am a curator, and I want to tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, I've been developing exhibitions in museums and galleries for the last 20 years, um, mainly working across the areas of uh, film, photography, and digital media. And um, I've developed a number of quite landmark shows in the digital field, which is why I've come here today to kind of talk to you in, in more detail. Um, there are a number of venues that support digital practice kind of in, in this country, but I guess what I'd like to do is make a play for a big kind of Tate Modern style venue, which is just about digital culture and nothing else. Um, we've got some great venues in the UK. We've got Lighthouse, we've got Fact, the Barbican, who I'm working for at the moment, do a lot of big digital interventions. But there is no one venue that deals with um, digital filmmaking, video games, animation, visual effects, those kinds of areas, which are the areas that I'm really interested in, as well as artists' practice with, with digital. And there are a number of those big venues around. I'm sure you all travel a lot, so you'd be aware of some of them. But um, you know, I guess most renowned venues are, are venues like ZKM in, in Germany. Also, um, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image in Melbourne, which is where I work formerly, kind of running the, um, the programmes, the creative programmes there. Also, venues like the Museum of Moving, Moving Image in New York, the new venue, the Bell Lightbox in Toronto, and um, the super new venue, which is being built at the moment, M Plus in Hong Kong, which is, again, very much devoted to design, but including digital media as part of the, the agenda. So there's a lots of key venues out there, but in a country where uh, digital practice is uh, so strong and so profound, um, we don't have one dedicated single venue. Um, and I think that's, that's a great pity. Um, we do have a number of um, different institutions, uh, of course, work, working away uh, with digital. And um, you may not know so much about what they do, but let, let me explain. Um, the Science Museum has just opened a really great new space called the Media Space in London, which is devoted to kind of artist practice and commissioning artists who are working with um, digital tools. Uh, their first commission was with Matt Pike recently, which was quite amazing. Um, the Victoria and Albert Museum have got a digital department now, so there's a team of curators there that are specifically thinking about curating digital exhibitions and also making acquisitions uh, to the collection, their collection. So one of the first things they acquired was the, um, the 3D printed gun, which you may have seen kind of in the press. Um, also, Tate Modern have been doing quite a lot. Um, Jane Burton, who's the head of digital there, has been commissioning a lot of new work by um, artists and filmmakers. So they produced a work um, which was a collaboration between Chris Milk and Aaron Coben um, called This Exquisite Forest recently, which was a, a kind of drawing application, but also a gallery installation and was really very, very popular. So it's sort of with all of that background that I want to tell you a little bit about um, what I do and the kinds of shows um, I organise. So um, I've always had a real passion for video games. I was kind of brought up in the 70s. I spent a lot of my youth in kind of arcades in Reading, where I'm from kind of originally. It was a great arcade called the Crystal Rooms. And um, it was Tempe ago, kind of on Pong and Space Invaders. And, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time kind of getting to know video game culture kind of when I was a kid. And I've carried that interest really, really um, throughout my life. Um, I curated a big exhibition called Game On in 2002 at the Barbican, which was the first... Um, sort of museum exploration of the history, culture, and future of video games. It, it followed kind of hot on the feet of Beryl Graham's Serious Games exhibition, which was a huge kind of project about kind of um, artists who are using interactive technology. Um, but what I wanted to do was to look at the commercial kind of games industry in, the, in an exhibition context and actually try and reveal who the creative people are who work uh, with, with games. Um, so let me ask you a question. Just think about this in your mind. Um, Think about your top five film directors. I think most of you can do that. Think about your top five musicians now. You've got some ideas in your mind. Now think about your top five video game developers. Now, some of you might be able to mention one or two. I guess very few of you will be able to mention kind of five or ten. Um, but there, there is a lack of kind of individual profile kind of in the video games kind of industry in general. And um, through my exhibitions, I really wanted to kind of highlight the work of some of the uh, creative auteurs that work within that field. Um, acknowledging, of course, that they work within large teams, but there are individuals who come up with ideas and actually kind of realise them. So that, that was in 2002. That show has been touring around under the auspices of Barbican International Enterprises for the last 10 years, all around the world, and it's been seen by about 2 million people. Um, both in Europe, in the Asia-Pacific region, um, across North and South America, which for me demonstrates to cultural institutions that it's a real kind of desire for digital culture 
within um, museum and gallery context, kind of like nothing else. Um, so skipping a little, little bit ahead, in 2011, the Smithsonian Institution in um, Washington, Washington did an exhibition called the, uh, the Art of Video Games, which is uh, a crowdsource project. They, they got the kind of audience to select the games and then um, profiled a series of key developers in, in the space. And that was a really important kind of intervention in the States in 2011. Then in 2012, MoMA in New York, the Museum of Modern Art, accession 10 video games into their design collections. I think that, that was a real moment of kind of cultural acceptance for video games. Um, and they were games that included kind of Space Invaders and Pac-Man and Pong, plus a, plus a number of others. Um, in 2012, I organized this, this show, which was called um, Game Masters at the Australian Center for the Moving Image, which was all about um, sort of video game auteurship. And um, what it did really was to look at a series of key um, video game developers and their work in kind of profile displays. So um, this slide is looking at the work of a Japanese uh, video game developer who is very famous for making kind of driving games called Yu Suzuki, who um, I went to visit in Japan and talked to a lot about um, his interest in interactive design. He, he, he produced a lot of driving games and, um, and motorbike kind of racing games. He's a fascinating character. Um, one of the sort of core principles of the kind of shows I organize with video games is actually to have as many as possible playable so uh, visitors can actually play the games, experience them, enjoy them. But there is a layer of interpretation that sits, sits above. And um, we've often kind of shot, shot um, you know, new interviews with developers for the, for the public to kind of watch within the gallery spaces. And then, of course, there's lots of information, text-based text and film-based, about um, their work but also a lot of um, kind of analog material as well, which does kind of ex exist in this field. Um, so this is, this is a display that I produced in the same exhibition looking at um, Blizzard Entertainment, who make the, um, the world of Warcraft, but specifically looking at the work of one of their founders called Chris Metzen, who um, worked to develop the kind of lore of the world of Warcraft, and in particular did a lot of concept artwork. Um, so we're combining kind of um, live gameplay online in this, in this space with you know, framed original art, artwork, um, some of the kind of legacy items of the sort of digital process. Um, another great kind of auteur developer is um, uh, uh, Tim Schaefer from Double Fine in San Francisco, um, who was formerly of kind of LucasArts and then went on to set his own, own company up. And I'll come back and talk about him in more detail uh, kind of later. But again, we, we showed a series of his key games like Broken Age and also took a lot of artwork from his studio. Um, and showed it in, in the exhibition. And it's, um, we might think that a lot of work is done kind of in computer and um, video game development studios, and of course that is, is the case. But um, there's also a lot of kind of analog artifacts that are made. So as a curator, you really need to go and visit studios and hunt these, these objects down, because there's a, I think amongst audiences, there's still a passion for kind of real objects. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a dichotomy here, because you know, m most of the legacy work is done in computer, and yet, uh, visitors are still keen to see real things that you can kind of hold and touch, although not literally, of course. Um, so, um, you know, performance is also kind of a big part of video game play, and um, there's a whole genre of kind of more full-body kind of dance and um, performance games. And um, I want to show this game uh, called Dance Central kind of in, in the space, um, which is made by a really kind of interesting kind of developer in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, we set up this dance stage kind of in, in the exhibition. Um, it's Dance Central 2, and um, allowed visitors to kind of really um, play and perform in the space. And it became the real kind of um, hub of, of, of the exhibition. Um, you, you get hundreds of people gathering around and uh, watching kind of members of the public kind of perform in, in space. And it kind of knocks on, this, uh, on the head this idea of um, video games being about solitary gameplay, that actually it's... Gameplay is very social, whether it's kind of online or using Skype or in a live gallery context like, like this. And, um, you know, it's a really fascinating kind of um, project to include in, in the exhibition. Um, I also sort of uh, had a big feature in the work of um, Tetsuya Mizuguchi, who uh, is kind of famous for his game Res and also this game, kind of Child of Eden, which was a 3D game. Again, um, you know, part of my work is to travel and meet up with, um, with participants in my exhibitions. And um, I met up with uh, Tetsuya Mizuguchi, who's a wonderful speaker and um, very interested in the, uh, the concept of synesthesia, synesthesia you know, the, uh, 
the experience of kind of um, sound and, and light and motion and what, how that affects us. So um, we showed a 3D kind of um, work uh, by him in the exhibition called Child of Eden, which had just come out at the, uh, at the time. Um, so, you know, the, the, the shows I, I do sort of often contrast the blockbuster kind of Hollywood produ production process against the sort of uh, the small-scale kind of independent scene. Um, so you might get kind of on a Warcraft game, perhaps a studio of 500 people working on one, one game. But uh, in the indie scene, you may get one or two people working on a game which is then released on the App Store. Um, and of course, with, with the App Store being, and Steam being such amazing kind of um, methods of distribution, you can get huge profile very quickly uh, like that. So the, the final section of the exhibition was uh, devoted to kind of um, independent video game practice and um, you know, showing some of the um, small games. I mean, in this, this case, a number of um, games that were made in Australia by very small studios like Fruit Ninja. I'm sure you've all kind of played that kind of um, from time to time. But it was uh, developed by um, a very small studio kind of in Brisbane. Um, that was about to close down, and um, the brief to the video game developer was to come up with a game in two weeks, otherwise you lose your job. And um, he came, came up with the game, and it's been downloaded now about 500 million times kind of around the world. So, um, you know, a very singular idea, a very strong idea, but um, through the App Store, kind of amazing uh, distribution, kind of as we all know. So... Um, the show that I've just opened um, in Melbourne was uh, a, a celebration of the work, works of, um, the work of DreamWorks Studios, was the 25th, 25th anniversary show. So I was working with, um, with Jeff, Jeffrey Katzenberg and um, with Bill Damaski, who's the creative director there, kind of um, you know, looking at a way in which we could sort of celebrate the, the kind of creativity of, of DreamWorks over a period of time. And I think unlike Pixar, DreamWorks is... A sort of, um, it doesn't necessarily have a singular kind of identity in, in, through its films. Um, its films are very much family or, orientated, predominantly kind of um, aimed at children. And it has a, has a quite sort of, um, each of its films has a unique ethos, I think, and a, and a unique kind of um, di direction style, if you like. Um, and of course, they're all animated films, so we can watch them in cinemas. So, what can you show in, in a museum gallery context? Um, so one of the things we came back to was the amazing kind of hand-drawn artwork, but um, I think only three of um, DreamWorks' films were actually uh, hand-drawn, you know, including The Prince of Egypt, which was one of their first films. Um, so there wasn't much kind of um, hand-drawn artwork, but of course there was a huge amount of kind of in-computer artwork. So I had the task of kind of going through the archives to try and identify kind of strong pieces of work. And then sort of thinking about the problem of showing digital artwork in a space and what that actually actually means because um, it's actually not kind of uh, real uh, analog work in a sense. It's sort of in computer work and by putting it in an art gallery that, that kind of um, gives it a very different sensibility. So as you can see in this, this image, what we did was sort of um, you know, not frame the, the, the digital artwork and so not suggesting it's kind of fine and has a rarity value but we did frame the... Um, the hand-drawn artwork in the background there, so just to create a distinction between the, um, the displays kind of in the exhibition. Um, so what does the new generation of uh, kind of digital natives do in a gallery space? Um, do they like to look at things in frames on a wall? Do they like to look at sculptures? Yes, they like to do a bit of that, but they also want to engage with the digital within the space as well. And I think um, this is a massive challenge for, for institutions. Um, people want to use their phone. They want... Um, a greater depth of information, um, and they want that very accessible in a very immediate way. Um, so these are some of the, um, the things that we do to kind of create that. Um, in this case, the, uh, the kids here are looking at um, an interactive kind of display, which is um, about the process of hand-drawn animation and, and what that means kind of in a studio context. Um, and, you know, visitors also want to contribute to dis displays as well and leave their mark. Um, so it's, in, it's important that those kinds of opportunities kind of are, are offered. Um, also, people want collective experiences. I mean, I think galleries are unique in the sense that they offer this sort of shared social experience, a place to uh, come along with your friends or individually and, and share an experience. But um, they also like to kind of watch things collectively as well. So here we have a sort of irony of a, of a kind of um, a cinema within an exhibition with, uh, with a group of people enjoying a behind-the-scenes film looking at uh, How to Train Your, Train Your Dragon 2, which is the new DreamWorks film coming out in a couple of weeks' time. So um, my new project, Digital Revolution, so it opens on the 2nd of July at the Barbican. Um, 
It is a big show. It's a festival. Um, it's it's um, in a gallery space called The Curve, but it's also around the entire building, and we've commissioned a lot of new work for the exhibition. Um, it's sponsored by, by Bloomberg, and we've um, had a very close working relationship with, um, with Google, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And these are some of the works that are in the show. Uh, the first section is called Digital Archaeology, and um, finding the objects has been very much an archaeological process, um, largely a lot of time spent on eBay, uh, looking for original ar uh, artifacts, uh, you know, arcade games, home consoles, and, and, and so on. Um, so we have some arcade games in the show. Um, we're also looking at um, you know, computer PC platforms. So this is, a, this is a prototype of the ZX Spectrum that we've got from the, um, the guy who designed the ZX Spectrum, the original designer. Um, and really, this section has got about 50 different projects in it that kind of look at the, um, a series of key uh, digital projects across the areas of contemporary art, film, music, and video games. Um, and this section introduces all the media forms. So we're looking at um, Jeff Minter, for example. Um, Aspen Movie Map, an early mapping pro project. Um, try, trying to kind of um, lift the lid on some really important kind of um, female stories. Um, female developers uh, often kind of overlooked within this, this world, um, but we're you know, giving Susan Kerr a lot of attention, who worked for Apple in the early days and um, was involved in developing kind of Mac Paint um, and showing some of her kind of artwork, uh, looking at the kind of story of pixel artwork. Um, uh, we Feel Fine, which is amazing, amazing kind of web work. Uh, the Johnny Cash Project by Chris Milk and Aaron Cobin. So this section is all about um, communities and how communities kind of work together online. Uh, we're celebrating the work of Notch Person, kind of um, Minecraft, um, and then looking at Kickstarter and its influence through the lens of uh, Tim Schafer's game Broken Age, which was, um, I think they raised three and a half million dollars through Kickstarter and um, uh, produced this game which um, uh, fans have really been able to con con contribute to in quite a detailed and rich, rich way. Um, other projects like the um, Deleted City and some other maker projects where uh, you know, individual makers have worked either um, with, with, with DIY platforms like um, Raspberry Pi, etc. Um, we have a big section on um, visual effects, which is called Creative Spaces. Um, uh, this is one of the key things in the exhibition. It's really the first time that visual effects have ever been kind of showcased in an exhibition in the gallery. So we've been working with Warner Brothers on two displays. Um, one um, looking at the work of um, Tim Weber on gravity, and another display looking at um, the work of Paul Franklin, who works for um, Double Negative on Inception, and um, really kind of lifting the lid on those two uh, big companies who are massive employers, kind of in London, and highly creative. Um, we also celebrate the, um, the work of recording artists and the collaborations that they've made with um, with artists um, to revisualize their work in various different ways. So we're looking at a number of different projects. Um, some of them are interactive music videos, some of them are linear music videos. We're looking at apps like Bjork's Biophilia, and we're doing a huge commission, um, which is a collaboration between uh, the recording artist Will I Am and Yori Suzuki, Suzuki um, a Japanese designer, uh, called Pyramidy, which is a, um, an, a robotic kind of music box, which is going to be fantastic. Um, showing Dance Central, because I love it. Um, also working with a number of artists like Rafael Lozano Hemmer um, and Chris Milk, who deal with camera-based technologies. So for artists, the connect connectors have been very important. Um, Microsoft very kindly kind of open-sourced the software. And um, this major work, uh, commissioned by in Intel by Chris Milk, um, uses Connect technology, hopefully Connect 2. Um, and it's a three-screen um, shadow play work, which takes you through um, a narrative which is about... Um, you know, life, death, and rebirth. Um, and your image is reflected on this huge water pool, which is in, in the gallery. It's kind of our biggest work. Um, and we've collaborated with, with Google on um, a section called Dev Art, which looks at artists who are very engaged with code. So it looks at the creative code movement. So um, working some of these artists will probably be familiar with, uh, for you, uh, to you. Zach Lieberman, who's doing a big new work about internet radio. Um, Vara Gurdjieff and Mark Kane are kind of... Um, uh, husband and wife duo who are doing this um, uh, great work which is all about uh, wishes. It's called Wishing Wall. And um, you, uh, using Google Speech API, you make a wish and see your wish turned into a butterfly kind of on this huge screen. It's going to be really elegant work. And then finally in this section, uh, a work by um, Carsten Schmidt, which is a 3D printing work, which allows visitors to design um, a 3D object um, and then, um, through a voting system, uh, a winner is nominated each day 
The next day, the work is printed out, and then that work is displayed in the gallery. Uh, 72 works are going to be produced over 72 days, which is the duration of the show. It should look very beautiful. Um, and, and then this work, um, which is the work that we've commissioned through a major kind of international kind of uh, online commission um, by um, some artists called Cyril and Beatrice. They're from France. And they're doing um, a really great kind of um, narrative interactive work, work which is um, called The Metamorphosis of Dr. Carlia, um, which is going to be really kind of exciting. Um, finally, some other projects at the, um, at the Barbican. You may have seen some of these. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of keen on these full body kind of digital experiences, digital beyond the screen. So you may have seen Rain Room that we produced, um, working with Random International. Uh, UVA's um, new work called Momentum, which is um, you know, using, using uh, sort of drones and haze, which is wonderful. Uh, we've commissioned a work by Umbrellium using projected light and lasers. Um, and a uh, new uh, work by Marshmallow La Laser Feast, one of the really innovative companies in London, producing kind of um, audio interactive kind of environments. Working with architects like Minimum Forms, um, we have a robotic work um, in the show, which also uses AI technology, which will be in the public space. A new work by Matt Pike, which is um, a kind of uh, animate, uh, animation kind of app that visitors can use. And um, a little bit about the future. The subject of the talk was curating the future. Uh, these are kind of works that are drawn from the future section of the exhibition. Um, I've gone over time, so I can't tell you about all of them, but um, we're looking at um, quite a lot of wearables in this section. So uh, looking at Cute, Cute Circuit and The Unseen, who are producing fantastic kind of wearables um, using new technologies. And uh, finally, because um, we were talking about drones earlier on, a work by um, Liam Young, which is actually going to be a concert with John Cale on the 7th of September in the Barbican Hall. If you're in London, come along. Um, John Cale is playing with a, with a kind of posse of eight drones that will be carrying speakers around the concert hall. And if you're in the audience, you'll be sitting under a net, so you've no need to worry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for inviting me.